Chapter Fifteen of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Kate Bonnet, The Romance of a Pirate's Daughter, by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter Fifteen. THE GOVERNOR OF JAMAICA The Governor of Jamaica was much interested in the visit of Kate Bonnet, whom he saw alone in a room adjoining the public apartments. He had met her two or three times before, and had been forced to admit that the young girls of Barbados must be pretty and piquant in an extraordinary degree, and he had not wondered that his friend, Captain Vince, should have spoken of her in such an enthusiastic manner. But now she was different. Her sorrow had given her dignity, and had added to her beauty. She quickly told her tale, and he started upright in his chair as he heard it. "'Do you mean,' he exclaimed, "'that that pirate, after whom I sent the badger, is your father?' "'It amazes me.' The similarity of names did not strike me. I never imagined any connection between you and the captain of that pirate ship. That's what Captain Vince said when I last saw him, remarked Kate. It must have astounded him to know it, exclaimed the governor, and I wonder, knowing it, that he consented to obey my orders. And had I been in his place, I would have preferred to be dismissed from the service rather than to sail after your father and to destroy him. If I had known what I know now, my orders to Captain Vince would have been very different from what they were. I would have told him to capture your father and to bring him here to me. It cannot be that he is in his right mind. Now Kate was weeping. The terrible words, destroy him and the assurance that if she had thought sooner of appealing to the governor, much misery, or at least the thought of misery, might have been spared her, so affected her that she could not control herself. The governor did not attempt to console her. Her sorrow was natural, and it was her right. When she looked up again, she spoke about what she had come to ask him for. The authority to bring back her father wherever she might find him, and to defend him from the attacks of all persons, whoever they might be, until she reached Jamaica. And then she told him how she would seek for her father on every sea. The governor sat and pondered. The father of such a girl should be saved from the terrible fate awaiting him, if the thing could possibly be done. And yet... What a difficult, almost hopeless thing it was to do, to find a pirate, a fierce and bloody pirate, and bring him back unharmed to his daughter's arms and to reasonable restraint. He spoke earnestly. What you propose, he said, you cannot do. It would be impossible for you to find your father, and if you did, no matter who might be with you, and no matter how successful you might be with him, his crew would not let him go. But there is one thing which might be done. The Badger will report at different stations, and her course and present cruising ground might be discovered. Thus I might send a dispatch to Captain Vince, ordering him not to harm your father, but to take him prisoner, and to bring him here to be dealt with. Kate sprang to her feet. "'An order to Captain Vince!' she exclaimed. "'An order to withhold his hand from my father. "'Ah, sir, your goodness is great. "'This is far more than I had dared to expect. "'When I last saw Captain Vince, he left me in a great rage. "'But, knowing that he would respect your order, "'I would dare his rage. "'If his revengeful hand should be withheld from my father, "'I would fear nothing.' "'I beg you to be seated,' said the governor, "'and let me assure you that in offering to send this order to Captain Vince "'I do not in the least expect you to take it. "'But there is one thing I do not understand. 
why should the captain have left you in a great rage perhaps i have not a right to ask this but it seems to me to have some bearing upon his alacrity in setting forth in pursuit of the revenge i fear said kate that this may be true i do not deem it improper for me to say to you sir that captain vince made me an offer of marriage and that in order to induce me to accept it he offered should he come up with the revenge to spare my father and to let him go free visiting the punishment he was sent to inflict upon the rest of the people in the ship i am surprised said the governor to hear you say that such an action would have been direct disobedience to his orders it would have been disloyalty which not even the possession of your fair hand could justify and you refused his offer that i did said kate her face flushing at the recollection of the unpleasant interview with the captain i cared not for him and even had i i would not have consented to wed a man who offered me his dishonour as a bribe for doing so not even for my father's life would i become the bride of such a one well spoken mistress bonnet exclaimed the governor your heart though a tender is a stout one but this you tell me of captain vince is very bad he is a vindictive man and will have what he wants even without regard to the means by which he may get it i am glad to know what you have told me mistress bonnet and if i had known it betimes i would not have sent in pursuit of your father a man whose anger had been excited against his daughter but now i shall dispatch orders to captain vince which shall be very exact and peremptory after he has received them he will not dare to harm your father and would cause him to be brought here as i command from my heart i thank you sir cried kate give me the orders and i will take them or i will nay nay said the governor such offices are not for you but i will give the matter my present attention on any day a vessel may enter the port with news of the badger and on any day a vessel may clear from kingston possibly for bridgetown where i imagine the badger will first touch rely upon me my dear young lady my order shall go to captain vince by the very earliest opportunity kate rose and thanked him warmly this is much to do your excellency for one poor girl she said it is but little to do said the governor and that girl be yourself with that he rose offered kate his arm and conducted her to her uncle when mr delaplaine was made acquainted with the result of the interview both his gratitude and surprise were great he comprehended far better than kate could the extent of the favour which the governor had offered to bestow it was indeed extraordinary to commute what was really a sentence of death against a notorious and dangerous pirate for the sake of a beautiful and pleading woman an ambitious idea shot through the merchant's brain the governor was a widower he had met kate before was there any other lady on the island better fitted to preside over the gubernatorial household but although a man of high position could not wed the daughter of a pirate a pirate evidently of an unsound mind could be a judge demented as he truly was and thus the shadow of his crime be lifted from him this was a great deal to think in a very short time but the good merchant did it and the fervour of his thankfulness was greatly increased by his rapid reflections as they were on their way home kate's eyes were bright and her step lighter than it had been of late now uncle said she you know we shall not wait for any chance ship which may take the governor's dispatch we shall engage a swift vessel ourselves by which the orders may be carried and uncle when that ship sails i must go in her you cried mr delaplaine you go in search of the badger and captain vince that can never 
"'But remember, uncle,' cried Kate, "'it is just as likely that I shall meet my father's ship as any other, "'and then we can snap our fingers at all orders and all captains. "'My father shall be brought here, "'and the good governor will make him safe and free him, "'as he best knows how, from the terrible straits "'into which his disturbed reason has led him.' Her uncle would not darken Kate's bright hopes, ill-founded though he thought them. To look into those sparkling eyes again was a joy of which he would not deprive himself, if he could help it. "'Suppose he should capture our vessel!' she exclaimed. "'What a grand thing it would be for him, all unknowing, to spring upon our deck and instantly be captured by me! After that there would be no more pirate's life for him!' When Dame Charter heard what had happened at the governor's house, and had listened to the recital of Kate's glowing schemes, her eyes did not immediately glisten with joy. "'If you go, Mistress Kate,' said she, "'in search of your father or that wicked Captain Vince, I go with you, but I cannot go without my dickery. It is full time to expect his return, although, as he was to depend upon so many chances before he could come back, his absence may, with good reason, continue longer, and I could not have him come back and find his mother gone, no man knows where. For in such a quest, what man could know? Oh, Dickory will be here soon, cried Kate. Any ship which comes sailing towards the harbour may bring him. The governor of Jamaica was a man of great experience, and with a fairly clear insight into the ways of the wicked. When Kate and her uncle had left him, and he paced the floor, with the memory of the beautiful eyes of the pirate's daughter as they had been uplifted to his own, he felt assured that he could see rightly into the designs of the unscrupulous Captain Vince. Of what avail would it be for him to kill the father of the girl who had rejected him? It would be an atrocious but temporary triumph, scarcely to be considered. But to capture that father, to disregard the laws of the service and the orders of his superiors, which he had already proposed to do, to communicate with Kate and to hold up before her terror-stricken eyes the life of her father, to be ended in horror or enjoyed in peace as she might decide, that would be Vince, as the governor knew him. The governor knew well his man, and those were the designs and intentions of Captain Christopher Vince of His Majesty's Corvette, the Badger. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Kate Bonnet This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jennifer Painter Kate Bonnet, The Romance of a Pirate's Daughter, by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter 16. A Question of Etiquette. Proudly sailed the Revenge and her attendant bark into the waters of Honduras Gulf, and proudly stood Captain Steed Bonnet upon his quarter-deck, dressed in a handsome uniform which might have been that of a captain or admiral in the Royal Navy. One hand caressed his ornate sword-hilt, while the other was thrust into the bosom of his gilt-embroidered coat. A newly fashioned Jolly Roger, in which the background was very black, and the skull and crossbones ghastly white, flew from his masthead. As night came on there could be seen, twinkling far away upon the horizon, a beacon-light, which in those days was kept burning for the benefit of the piratical craft which made a rendezvous of the waters of Belize, then the commercial centre for the vessels of the Free Companions. Having supposed, in his unnautical mind, that his entrance into the Gulf of Honduras meant the end of his present voyage, and not wishing to lower his own feeling of importance by asking too many questions of his inferiors, Captain Bonnet had bedecked himself a day too soon, and there were some jeers and sneers among his crew when he descended to his cabin 
to take off his fine clothes. But his self-complacency was well armoured, and he did not hear the jokes of which he was the subject, especially by the little clique of which Black Paul was the centre. But the sailing-master knew his business, and the revenge was safely, though slowly, sailed among the coral reefs and islands, until she dropped anchor off Belize. Early in the morning, the now dignified and pompous Captain Bonnet, of that terror of the seas, the pirate craft revenge, again arrayed himself in a manner befitting his position, and stationed himself on the quarter-deck, where he might be seen by the eyes of all the crews of the other pirate vessels anchored about them, and by the glasses of their officers. Apart from a general desire to show himself in the ranks of his fellow pirates, and to receive from them the respect which was due to a man of his capabilities and general merits, Steed Bonnet had a particular reason for his visit to this port, and for surrounding himself with all the pomp and circumstance of high piratical rank. He had been informed that a great man, a hero and chief among his fellows, in fact, the dean of the piratical faculty, and known as Blackbeard, the most desperate and reckless of all the pirates of the day, was now here. To meet this most important sea robber, and to receive from him the hand of fellowship, had been Bonnet's desire and ambition since he had heard that it was possible. The morning was advanced, and the revenge was rolling easily at her anchorage, but Bonnet was somewhat uncertain as to the next step he ought to take. He wanted to see Blackbeard as soon as possible, but it would certainly be a breach of etiquette entirely inconsistent with his present position for him to go to see him. He was the latest comer, and thought it was the part of Blackbeard to make the first visit. Paul Bitten now came aft. "'The men are getting very restless,' he said. They want to go on shore. They'd all go if I'd let them. Captain Bonnet gave his sailing master a lofty glare. If I should let them, you mean, sir, I am sorry I cannot break you of the habit of forgetting that I command this ship. Well, sir, you may tell them that they cannot go. I am expecting a visit from the renowned Blackbeard, now in this port, and I wish to welcome him with all respect and a full crew. Black Paul smiled disagreeably. I will tell you, sir, that you cannot keep these men on board much longer with the town of Belize within a row of half a mile. They've been at sea too long for that. There'll be a mutiny, sir, if I go forward with that message of yours. It will be prudent to let some of them go ashore now, and others later in the day. I will go in the first boat and see to it that the men come back with me. And, by the way, it would be no bad thing if I touch at Blackbeard's vessel and inform him that you are here. I don't suppose he knows the revenge, nor her captain neither. I doubt that, Bitten, said Bonnet. I doubt it very much. I assure you that I am known from one end of this coast to the other and Captain Blackbeard is not an ignorant man. So, you can go on shore and take some of the men, stopping at Blackbeard's ship. And, by the way, I want you to go by that bark of ours and give her the old Black Roger I used to fly. I forgot to send it to her, and a man might as well not own and command two vessels if he get not the credit of it. When Black Paul had gone to execute his orders, Ben Greenway heaved a heavy sigh. Now I begin to fear, Master Bonnet, that the day o' your salvation has really gone by, when ye not only murder and rob upon the high seas, but keep consort with other murderers and robbers, then I fear ye are indeed lost. But I shall stand by ye, Master Bonnet, I shall stand by ye, and if ever I find there is the least bit o' ye to be snatched from the flames, I'll snatch it. 
"'I don't like that sort of talk, Ben Greenway,' cried Bonnet, "'especially at this time when my soul swells with content "'at the success which has crowned my undertakings. "'This Blackbeard is a valiant man, and a great one, "'but it is my belief that when we have sat down to compare our notes, "'it will be found that I have captured as many cargoes, "'burned as many ships.' and marooned as many people in my last cruise as he has. So I suppose, said Ben, that ye... Correction. So I suppose, said Ben, that ye think ye have achieved the right to sink deeper into hell than he can ever hope to do? Bonnet made no answer, but turned away. The Scotchman was becoming more and more odious to him every day but he would not quarrel on this most auspicious morning. He must keep his mind unruffled and his head high. He had his own plans about Greenway. He was not far from Barbados, and when he left the harbour of Belize, it would be of advantage to his peace of mind, as well as to the comfort of a faithful old servant, if he should anchor for a little while in the river below the town and put Ben Greenway on shore. Ben gave no further reason for quarrelling. He was greatly dejected, but he had sworn to himself to stand by his old master, no matter what might happen, and when he took an oath he meant what he swore. Dickory Charter was in much worse case than Ben Greenway. He was not much of a geographical scholar, but he knew that the Gulf of Honduras was not really very far from the island of Jamaica, where dwelt waited and watched mistress kate bonnet and his mother if he had known that during the voyage down from the atlantic coast the revenge had sailed through the windward passage running in some of her long tacks within less than a day's sail of jamaica he would have chafed fumed and fretted even more than he did now captain bonnet he cried if you could but let me go on shore I might surely find some vessel bound to Kingston, or to any place upon the island of Jamaica, from which spot I could make my way on foot, even if it were on the opposite end. Thus I could take messages and letters from you to your daughter and Mr. Della Plain, and ease the minds both of them and my mother, all of whom must now be in most doleful plight, not knowing anything about you, or hearing anything from me, and this for so long a time. Then you could remain here with no feelings of haste until you had disposed of your cargoes and had finished your business. Captain Bonnet stood loftily with a smile of benignity upon his face. It is a clever plan, said he, and you are a good fellow, Dickory, but your scheme, though well-intentioned, is unsound. I have too much regard for you to trust you in any vessel sailing from Belize to Kingston, where there are often naval vessels. Going from this port, you would as likely to be strung up to the yard arm as to be allowed to go ashore. Be patient then, my good fellow. When my affairs are settled here, the revenge may run up to the coast of Jamaica, where you may be put off at some quiet spot and all may happen as you have planned, my good Dickory. Even now I am writing a letter, hoping for some such opportunity of sending it to my daughter. Dickory sighed in despair. It might take a month or more before Kate's father could settle his affairs. And how long, how long it had been since his soul had been reaching itself out towards Kate and his mother! When the sailing-master set out in the long-boat, crowded with men, he stopped at the bark, but did not go too near for fear that some of the crew might jump into his already overloaded boat. "'You are to run up this rag!' cried Black Paul to Clip, the fellow in command. And so saying, he handed up the old Jolly Roger on the blade of an oar. Our noble admiral fears that if you do not, that you may be captured by some of these good vessels lying here about. Clip roared out with a laugh. I will attend to the capture, 
as soon as I get out of reach of his guns, which he will not dare to use here, I take it. But I want you to know, and him to know, that we're not going to stay on board and inside of the town. If you go ashore, so go we. Stay where ye are till orders come to ye, shouted Blackpool, if ye want to keep the cat off your backs. And as he rowed away, the men on the bark gave him a cheer and proceeded to lower two boats. From nearly every pirate ship in the anchorage, the proceedings of the newly arrived vessels had been watched. No one wanted to board them, or in any way to interfere with them, until it was found out what they intended to do. The Revenge was a stranger in that harbour, although her fame was known on not a few pirate decks. But if she came to Belize to fraternise with the other pirate vessels there gathered together, why didn't she do it? No idea of importance and dignity, which his position imposed upon Captain Steed Bonnet, entered their piratical minds. When the longboat put forth from the Revenge, a good deal of interest was excited in the anchored vessels. The great Blackbeard himself stood high upon his deck and surveyed the strangers through a glass. The men in the sailing master's boat rowed steadily towards Blackbeard's vessel. Bitten knew it well, for he had seen it before, and had even had the honour, so to speak, of having served for a short time under the master pirate of that day. As soon as the boat was near enough, Blackbeard hailed it in a tremendous voice, and ordered the stranger to pull up and make fast. This being done, a rope ladder was lowered, and Bitten mounted to the deck, being assisted in his passage over the side by a tremendous pull given by Blackbeard. The great pirate seemed to be in high good spirits, and very glad to see his visitor. Blackbeard was a large man, wide and heavy, and the first impression conveyed by his personality was that of hair and swarthiness. An untrimmed black beard lay upon his chest, and his long hair hung in masses from under his slouched hat. His eyes were dark and sparkling, and gleamed like beacon lights from out a midnight sky. The sleeves of his shirt were rolled up, and his arms seemed almost as hairy as his head. Two pairs of pistols were stuck into his belt, and a great cutlass was conveniently tucked up by his side. "'Ho, ho!' he cried. "'Black Paul! And where do you come from, and what are you doing here? "'And what is the name of that vessel with the brand-new Roger? "'Has she just gone into the business, that she decks herself out so fine? "'Come now, sit here and have some brandy.' and tell me what is the meaning of these two vessels coming into the harbour, and what you have to do with them. Bitten was delighted to know that his old commander remembered him, and was ready enough to talk with him, for that was the errand he had come upon. But, Captain, said he, I am afraid to wander away from the gunwale, for if I have not my eye upon them, my men will be rowing to the town before I know it. They are mad to be on shore." Blackbeard made no answer. He stepped to the side of the vessel and looked over. "'Let go!' he shouted to the man who held the boat's rope. "'And you rascals, row out a dozen strokes from my vessel and keep your boat there. And if you move an oar towards the town, I will sink you.' With that he ordered two small guns to be trained upon the boat. The boat's crew did not hesitate one second in obeying these orders. They knew by whom they were given, and there was no man in the great body of free companions who would disobey an order given by Blackbeard. They rowed to the position assigned to them, and sat quietly looking into the mouths of the two cannon which were pointed towards them. "'Now then,' said Blackbeard, turning to Bitten, "'I think they'll stay there till they get some other order.' Between frequent sips at the cup of brandy, Bitten told the story of the revenge, and Blackbeard listened with many an oath and many a pound upon his massive knee by his mighty fist. 
oh i have heard of him he cried i have heard of him he has played the devil along the atlantic coast he must be a great fellow this what did you say his name was bonnet said the other blackbeard laughed that suits him well he must have clapped his name over the eyes of many a merchant captain where did he sail before he hoisted the jolly roger at this bitten laughed he never sailed anywhere he is no seaman and if he were not rich enough to pay others to do his navigating for him he would have run his vessel upon the first sandbar on his way from bridgetown to the sea but he pays some good mariner to sail his revenge and he now pays me i am in fact the captain of his vessel you mean cried blackbeard that he knows nothing of navigation not a whit replied the other he doesn't know the backstays from the taffrail was only yesterday that he thought he was already in the port of belize and dressed himself up like a fighting cock to meet you to meet me roared blackbeard what does he want to meet me for and why don't he come and do it instead of sending you not he said bitten he is a great man if not a sailor he knows what is politeness on shipboard and as he is the last comer you must be the first caller he's all dressed up now hoping that you will row over to the revenge as soon as you know that he is its commander the hairy pirate leaned back and laughed in loud explosions he is a rare man truly he exclaimed this captain nightcap of yours bonnet interrupted bitten well one is as good as the other cried blackbeard and he be well clothed if it be of the right colour and you started out with him to sail his ship you rascal that's a piece of impudence almost as great as his own bitten did not much like this speech and wanted to explain that since he had served under blackbeard he had commanded vessels himself but he restrained himself and told how sam loftus had been tumbled overboard for running afoul his captain and how he had been appointed to his place now blackbeard laughed again with a great pound upon his knee he is a man after my own heart he shouted be he sailor or no sailor this nightcap commander of yours i know i shall love him and springing to his feet and uttering a resounding oath he swore that he would visit his new brother that afternoon now away with you cried blackbeard and and tell sir nightcap bonnet interrupted bitten well bonnet or cap it matters not to me row straight back to your ship and let him know that i shall be there and shall expect to be received with admiral's honours bitten looked somewhat embarrassed but captain he said my men are on their way to the town and i fear me they will rebel if i tell them they cannot now go there in saying this the sailing master spoke not only for his men but for himself he was very anxious to go ashore he had business there he wanted to see who were in the place and what was going on before bonnet should go to the town what cried blackbeard putting his head down like a charging bull i order you to row back to your vessel and take my message and if you do it not i will sink you all in a bunch into your boat sir and waste not another minute if you are not able to command your men i will keep you here and give them a coxswain who can without another word bitten scuffled over the side and his boat being brought up he dropped into it now men he said i have a message from captain blackbeard to the revenge bend to it as i steer that way give my pious regards to your sir nightcap shouted blackbeard and then in a still higher tone he yelled to them that if they disobeyed their coxswain and turned their bow shoreward he would sink them all to the unsounded depths of hades without a protest the men pulled vigorously towards the revenge while black paul considering it a new affront to be called coxswain when he was in reality captain earnestly sent blackbeard 
to the same regions to which he had just referred. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of Kate Bonnet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begaman, Somerville, South Carolina. Kate Bonnet by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter Seventeen An Ornamented Beard it was about the middle of the afternoon when a large boat well filled was seen approaching the revenge from blackbeard's vessel as soon as it had become known that this chief of all pirates of that day this edward thatch of england was really coming on board the revenge not one word was uttered among the crew on the subject of going ashore although they had been long at sea the shore could wait when blackbeard was coming even to look upon this doughty desperado would be an honor and a joy to the brawny scoundrels who made up the crew of the revenge it might have been supposed that everything upon captain bonnet's vessel had been made ready for the expected advent of blackbeard but nothing seemed good enough nothing seemed as effectively placed and arranged as it might have been and with execrations and commands bonnet hurried here and there making everything if possible more shipshape than it had been before stay you two in the background he said to ben greenway and dickory you are both landsmen and you don't count in a ceremony such as this is going to be station your men as i told you bittern and man the yards when it is time captain bonnet in his brave uniform and wearing a cocked hat with a feather his hand upon his sword hilt stood up tall and stately when the boat was made fast and the great pirate's head appeared above the rail six cannon roared a welcome and bonnet stepped forward hand extended and hat uplifted the instant blackbeard's feet touched the deck he drew from their holsters a pair of pistols and fired them in the air now then he shouted we are even salute for salute for my pistols are more than equal to the cannon of any other man how goes it with you sir nightcap bonnet i mean and with that he clasped the hand reached out to him in a bone-crushing grasp his fingers aching and his brain astonished bonnet could not comprehend what sort of a man it was who stood before him with hair purposely dishevelled with his hat more slouched than usual with his beard divided into tails each tied with a different coloured ribbon with half a dozen pistols strung across his breast with other pistols and a knife or two stuck into his belt with his great sword by his side and his eyes gleaming brighter than ever and a general expression both in face and figure of an aggressive impudence blackbeard stood on his stout legs clothed in rough red stockings and gazed about him but the captain of the revenge did not forget his manners he welcomed blackbeard with all courtesy and besought him to enter his poor cabin blackbeard laughed poor cabins say you but i'll tell you this one thing my valiant captain cap you have not a poor vessel not a poor vessel i swear that to you my brave captain i swear that then with no attention to bonnet's invitation captain blackbeard strolled about the deck examining everything cursing this and praising that and followed by captain bonnet black paul and a crowd of admiring pirates ben greenway bowed his head and groaned i doubt if master bonnet will ever go to the dale as i feared he would for now has the dale come to him oh dickory dickory this master o mine was a worthy mon an a good un when i first came to him an a that i ha i owe to him for i was in sad case 
dickory very sad case but now that he has apollyon for his teacher he'll cease to know righteousness altogether dickory was angry and out of spirits he is a vile poltroon this master of yours said he consorting with these bloody pirates and leaving his daughter to pine away her days and nights within a little sail of him while he struts about at the heel of a dirty freebooter dressed like a monkey he doesn't deserve the daughter he possesses oh that i could find a ship that would take me back to jamaica and i would take you too ben greenway for it is a foul shame that a good man should spend his days in such vile company ben shook his head i'll stand by master bonnet he said until the day comes when i shall bid him farewell at the door o hell i can go no farther than that dickory no farther than that from forecastle to quarter-deck from bowsprit to taffrail blackbeard scrutinized the revenge what mean you dog he said to bittern bonnet being at a little distance you tell me he is no mariner this is a brave ship and well appointed ay ay said the sailing master it has the neatness of his kitchen or his storehouses but if his cables were coiled on his yard-arms or his anchor hung up to dry upon the main shrouds he would not know that anything was wrong it was big sam loftus who fitted out the revenge and i myself have kept everything in good order and shipshape ever since i took command command growled blackbeard for a charge of powder i would knock in the side of your head for speaking with such disrespect of the brave sir nightcap the supper in the cabin of the revenge was a better meal than the voracious blackbeard had partaken of for many a year if indeed he had ever sat down to such a sumptuous repast before him was food and drink fit for a stout and hungry seafaring man and there were wines and dainties which would have fit place upon the table of a gentleman blackbeard was in high spirits and tossed off cup after cup and glass after glass of the choicest wine and the most fiery spirits he clapped his well-mannered host upon the back as he shouted some fragment of a wild sea-song and who is this he cried as they rose from the table and he first caught sight of ben greenway is this your chaplain he looks as sanctimonious as an empty rum cask and that baby boy there what do you keep him for are they for sale i would like to buy the boy and let him keep my accounts i warrant he has enough arithmetic in his head to divide the prize money among the men he is no slave said bonnet he came to this vessel to bring me a message from my daughter but he is an ill-bred stripling and can neither read nor write then let's kill him cried blackbeard and drawing his pistol he sent a bullet about two inches above dickory's head at this the men who had gathered themselves at every available point set up a cheer never before had they beheld such a magnificent and reckless miscreant dickory did not start or move but he turned very pale and then he reddened and his eyes flashed blackbeard swore at him a great approbative oath a brave boy he cried and fit to carry messages if for nothing else and what is this nonsense about a daughter said he to bonnet we abide no such creatures in the ranks of the free companions we drown them like kittens before we hoist the jolly roger when blackbeard's boat left the ship's side the departing chieftain fired his pistols in the air as long as their charges lasted while the motley desperadoes of the revenge gave him many a parting yell then all the boats of the revenge were lowered and every man who could crowd into them left their ship for the shore black paul tried to restrain them for he feared to leave the revenge too weakly manned she having such a valuable cargo but his orders and shouts were of no avail 
and despairing of stopping them the sailing master went with them and as they pulled wildly towards the town the men of one boat shouted to another and that one to another hurrah for our captain the brave sir nightcap hurrah 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 the dirty satan exclaimed dickory as he gazed after blackbeard's boat i would kill him if i could say not so dickory said captain bonnet speaking gravely that great pirate is not a man of breeding and he speaks with disesteem alike of friend and enemy but he is the famous blackbeard and we must treat him with honor although he pays us none i had deemed said greenway calmly that ye were going to be the most unholy sinner that ever blackened this fair earth but not only did ye tell a pious lie for the sake of good dickory but compared with that monstrosity ye are a saint graved in marble master bonnet a white and shapely saint blackbeard's boat was not rowed to his vessel but his men pulled steadily shoreward with the wild crew of the revenge fresh from sea and their appetites whetted for jovial riot and with blackbeard his war paint on to lead them into every turbulent excess there were wild times in the town of belize that night End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of kate bonnet this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by gloria begaman somerville south carolina kate bonnet by frank r stockton chapter eighteen i have no right i am a pirate as has been made plain captain bonnet of the revenge was a punctilious man when the rules of society were concerned be that society official high-toned or piratical thus it was a positive duty in his mind to return to blackbeard's visit on the next day but until afternoon he was not able to do so on account of the difficulty of getting a sober and decently behaved boat's crew who should row him over black paul the sailing-master had returned to his vessel early in the morning feeling the necessity of keeping watch over the cargo but most of the men came over much later while some of them did not come at all bonnet was greatly inclined to punish with an unwonted severity this breach of rules but black paul assured him that it was always the custom for the crew of a newly arrived vessel to go ashore and have a good time and that if they were denied this privilege they would be sure to mutiny and he might be left without any crew at all bonnet grumbled and swore but as he was aware there were several things concerning a nautical life with which he was not familiar he determined to let pass this trespass dressed in his finest clothes and even better than the day before he was followed into the boat by ben greenway who vowed his captain should never travel without his chaplain who if his words were considered would be the most valuable officer on the vessel come then greenway said bonnet you have troubled me so much on my own vessel that now perchance you may be able to do me some service on that of another anyway i should like to have at least one decent person in my train who and you come not will be wholly missing and dickory may come too if he like it but dickory did not like it he hated the big black pirate and cared not if he should never see him again so he stayed behind when bonnet mounted to the deck of blackbeard's vessel he found there a very different pirate captain from the one who had called upon him the day before there were no tails to the great black beard there were few pistols visible 
and captain bonnet's host received him with a certain salt-soaked sun-browned hairy and brawny hospitality which did not sit badly upon him there was meat there was drink and then the two captains and greenway walked gravely over the vessel followed by a hundred eyes and before long by many a coarse and jeering laugh which bonnet supposed were directed at sturdy ben greenway deeming it quite natural though improper that the derision of these rough fellows should be excited by the appearance among them of a prim and sedate scotch presbyterian but that crew of miscreants had all heard of the derisive title which had been given to bonnet and now they saw without the slightest difficulty how little he knew of the various nautical points to which blackbeard continually called his attention the vessel was dirty it was ill-appointed there was an air of reckless disorder which showed itself everywhere but apart from his evident distaste for dirt and griminess the captain of the revenge seemed to be very well satisfied with everything he saw when he passed a small gun pointed across the deck and with a nightcap hung upon a capstan bar thrust into its muzzle there was such a great laugh that bonnet looked around to see what the imprudent greenway might be doing many were the nautical points to which blackbeard called his guest's attention and many the questions the grim pirate asked but in almost all cases of the kind the tall gentleman with the cocked hat replied that he had generally left those things to his sailing master being so much occupied with matters of more import although he found no fault and made no criticisms bonnet was very much disgusted such a disorderly vessel such an apparently lawless crew excited his most severe mental strictures and although the great blackbeard was to-day a very well-behaved person bonnet could not understand how a famous and successful captain should permit his vessel and his crew to get into such an unseamanlike and disgraceful condition on board the revenge as his sailing-master had remarked there was the neatness of his kitchen and his storehouses and although he did not always know what to do with the nautical appliances which surrounded him he knew how to make them look in good order but he made few remarks favorable or otherwise and held himself loftier than before with an air as if he might have been an admiral entire instead of resembling one only in clothes and with ceremonious and even condescending politeness followed his host wherever he was led above decks or below ben greenway had gone with his master about the ship with much of the air of one who accompanies a good friend to the place of execution regardless of jibes or insults whether they were directed at bonnet or himself he turned his face neither to the right nor to the left and apparently regarded nothing that he heard but while endeavoring to listen as little as possible to what was going on around him he heard a great deal but strange to say the railing and scurrility of the pirates did not appear to have a depressing influence upon his mind in fact he seemed in somewhat better spirits than when he came on board whatever he may do whatever he may say and whatever he may swear said the scotchman to himself he is no like ain of these try as he may he canna descend so low into the blackness o evil as these sons of perdition although he has done evil beyond a poor mortal's computation he walks like a king among them even that black beard striving to be decent for an hour or two knows a superior when he meets him 
when they had finished the tour of the vessel blackbeard conducted his guest to his own cabin and invited him to be seated by a little table bonnet sat down placing his high-plumed cocked hat upon the bench beside him he did not want anything more to eat or to drink and he was in fact quite ready to take his leave the vessel had not pleased him and had given him an idea of the true pirate's life which he had never had before on the revenge he mingled little with the crew scarcely ever below decks and his own quarters were as neat and commodious as if they were on a fine vessel carrying distinguished passengers dirt and disorder if they existed were at least not visible to him but although he had no desire ever to make another visit to the ship of the great blackbeard he would remember his position and be polite and considerate now that he was here moreover the savage desperado of the day before dressed like a monkey and howling like an indian seemed now to be endeavouring to soften himself a little and to lay aside some of his savage eccentricities in honour of the captain of that fine ship the revenge so clothed in a calm dignity bonnet waited to hear what his host had further to say blackbeard seated himself on the other side of the table on which he rested his massive arms behind him ben greenway stood in the doorway for a few moments blackbeard sat and gazed at bonnet and then he said look ye steed bonnet do you know you are now as much out of place as a red herring would be at the top of the mainmast bonnet flushed i fear captain blackbeard he said i very much fear me that you are right this is no place for me i have paid my respects to you and now if you please i will take my leave i have not been gratified by the conduct of your crew but i did not expect that their captain would address me in such discourteous words and with this he reached out his hand for his hat blackbeard brought down his hand heavily upon the table sit where you are he exclaimed i have that to say to you which you shall hear whether you like my vessel my crew or me you are no sailor steed bonnet of bridgetown and you don't belong to the free companions who are all good men and true and can sail the ships they command you are a defrauder and a cheat you are nothing but a landsman a plough-tail sugar planter at this insult bonnet rose to his feet and his hand went to his sword sit down roared blackbeard and you do not listen to me i'll cut off this parley and your head together sit down sir bonnet sat down pale now and trembling with rage he was not a coward but on board this ship he must give heed to the words of the desperado who commanded it you have no right continued blackbeard to strut about on the quarter-deck of that fine vessel the revenge you have no right to hoist above you the jolly roger and you have no right to lie right and left and tell people you are a pirate a pirate forsooth you are no pirate a pirate is a sailor and you are no sailor you are no better than a blind man led by a dog if the dog breaks away from him he is lost and if the sailing masters you pick up one after the other break away from you you are lost it is a cursed shame steed bonnet and it shall be no longer at this moment by my own right and for the sake of every man who sails under the jolly roger i take away from you the command of the revenge now bonnet could not refrain from springing to his feet 
take from me the revenge he cried my own vessel bought with my own money and how say you i am not a pirate from massachusetts down the coast into these very waters i have preyed upon commerce i have taken prizes i have burned ships i have made my name a terror now his voice grew stronger and his tones more angry not a pirate he cried go ask the galleons and the merchantmen i have stripped and burned go ask their crews now wandering in misery upon desert shores if they be not already dead and by what right i ask do you come to such an one as i am and declare that having put me in the position of a prisoner on your ship you will take away my own blackbeard gazed at him with half-closed eyes a malicious smile upon his face i have no right he said i need no right i am a pirate at these words bonnet's legs weakened under him and he sank down upon the bench as he did so he glanced at ben greenway as if he were the only person on earth to whom he could look for help but to his amazement he saw before him a face almost jubilant and beheld the scotchman his eyes uplifted and his hands clasped as in thankful prayer end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of kate bonnet this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gloria begaman somerville south carolina kate bonnet by frank r stockton chapter nineteen the new first lieutenant when the boat of the revenge was pulled back to that vessel bonnet did not go in it it was blackbeard who sat in the stern and held the tiller while one of his own men sat by him when blackbeard stepped on deck he announced much to the delight of the crew and the consternation of paul bittern that the revenge now belonged to him and that all the crew who were fit to be kept on board such a fine vessel would be retained and that he himself for the present at least would take command of the ship would haul down that brand new bit of woman's work at the masthead and fly in its place his own black ragged jolly roger dreaded wherever seen upon the sea at this a shout went up from the crew the heart of every scoundrel among them swelled with joy at the idea of sailing fighting and pillaging under the bloody blackbeard but the sailing-master stood aghast he had known very well what was going to happen he had talked it all over in the town with blackbeard he had drunk in fiery brandy to the success of the scheme and he had believed without a doubt that he was to command the revenge when bonnet should be deposed and now where was he where did he stand trembling a little he approached blackbeard and as for me he asked am i to command your old vessel you roared blackbeard making as if he would jump upon him you you may fall too and bend your back with the others in the forecastle or you can jump overboard if you like my quartermaster richards now commands my old vessel presently i shall go over and settle things on that bark but first i shall step down into the cabin and see what rare good things sir nightcap the sugar planter has prepared for me with this he went below followed by the man he had brought with him it was dickory half dazed by what he had heard who now stepped up to paul bittern the latter his countenance blacker than it had ever been before first scowled at him but in a moment the ferocity left his glance oh ho he said here's a pretty pickle for me and you as well as for bonnet and the scotchman 
do you suppose exclaimed dickory that what he says is true that he has stolen this ship from captain bonnet and that he has taken it for his own suppose sneered the other i know it he has stolen from me as well as from bonnet i should have commanded this ship and i had made all my plans to do it when i got here then you are as great a rascal said dickory as that vile pirate down below just as great said bittern the only difference being that he has won everything while i have lost everything what are we to do asked dickory i cannot stay here and i am sure you will not want to now while he is below can we not slip overboard and swim ashore i am sure i could do it black paul grinned grimly but where should we swim to he said on the coast of honduras there is no safety for a man who flees from blackbeard but keep your tongue close he is coming the moment blackbeard put his foot upon the deck he began to roar out his general orders i go over to the bark he said and shall put my mate here in charge of her after that i go to my own vessel and when i have settled matters there i will return to this fine ship where i shall strut about the quarter-deck and live like a prince at sea now look ye youngster what is your name charter replied dickory grimly well then charter the pirate continued i shall leave you in charge of this vessel until i come back which will be before dark me exclaimed dickory in amazement yes you said the pirate i am sure you don't know anything about a ship any more than your master did but he got on very well and so may you and now remember your head shall pay for it if everything is not the same when i come back as it is now thereupon this man of piratical business was rowed to the bark quite satisfied that he left behind him no one who would have the power to tamper with his interests he knew the crew having bound most of them to him on the preceding night and he trusted every one of them to obey the man he had set over them and no other as dickory would have no orders to give there would be no need of obedience and black paul would have no chance to interfere with anything when bonnet had been left by blackbeard who having said all he had to say hurried up the companionway to attend to the rest of his plans the stately naval officer who had so recently occupied the bench by the table shrunk into a frightened farmer gazing blankly at ben greenway think you ben he said in half a voice that this is one of that man's jokes i have heard that he has a fearful taste for horrid jokes the scotchman shook his head joke master bonnet he exclaimed it is no joke he has taen your ship from ye he has taen from ye your sword your pistols and your wicked black flag and he has made evil impossible to ye he has taen from ye the shame and the wretched wickedness o being a pirate think of that master bonnet ye are no longer a pirate that most devilish o all demons has preserved the rest o your life from the dishonour and the infamy which ye were labouring to heap upon it ye are a poor mon now master bonnet that beelzebub will strip ye everything ye had all your riches shall be his ye can no longer afford to be a pirate ye will be compelled to be an honest mon and i tell ye that my soul lifteth itself in thanksgiving and my heart is happier than it has been since that fearsome day when ye went on board your vessel at bridgetown ben said bonnet it is hard and it is cruel that in this the time of my great trouble you turn upon me i have been robbed i have been ruined my life is of no more use to me and you ben greenway revile me while i am prostrate revile said the scotchman i glory i rejoice 
ye hae been converted ye hae been changed ye hae been snatched from the jaws o hell moreover master bonnet my soul was rejoiced even before that master dale came to set ye free from your toils to look upon ye and see that although ye called yourself a pirate ye were no like ane o these black-hearted cutthroats ye were never as wicked master bonnet as ye said ye were you are mistaken groaned bonnet i tell you ben greenway you are mistaken i am just as wicked as i ever was and i was very wicked as you should admit knowing what i have done oh ben ben is it true that i shall never go on board my good ship again and with this he spread his arms upon the table and laid his head upon them he felt as if his career was ended and his heart broken ben greenway said no more to comfort him but at that moment he himself was the happiest man on the caribbean sea he seated himself in the little dirty cabin and his soul saw visions he saw his master deprived of all his belongings and with them of every taint of piracy and put on shore accompanied of course by his faithful servant he saw a ship sail perhaps soon perhaps later for jamaica he saw the blithe mistress kate her soul no longer sorrowing for an erring father come on board that vessel and sail with him for good old bridgetown he saw everything explained everything forgotten he saw before the dear old family a life of happiness perhaps he saw the funeral of madame bonnet and better than all he saw the pirate dead the good man revived again to be sure he did not see dickory charter returning to his old home with his mother for he could not know what blackbeard was going to do with that young fellow but as dickory had thought of him when he had escaped with kate from the revenge so thought he now of dickory there were so many other important things which bore upon the situation that he was not able even to consider the young fellow it did not take very long for a man of practical devilishness such as blackbeard was to finish the business which had called him away and he soon reappeared in the cabin ho there good sir nightcap and i may freely call you that since now i own you uniform cocked hat title and everything else don't cry yourself to sleep like a baby when its toys are taken away from it but wake up i have a bit of liking for you and i believe that that is because you are clean not having that virtue myself i admire it the more in others and i thank you from my inmost soul wherever that may be for having provided such comely quarters and such fair accommodations for me while i shall please to sail the revenge but i shall not condemn you to idleness and cankering thoughts my bold blusterer my terror of the sea my harrier of the coast my flaunter of the jolly roger washed clean in the tub with soap i shall give you work to do which shall better suit you than the troublesome trade you've been trying to learn you write well and read i know that my good sir nightcap and moreover you are a fair hand at figures i have great work before me in landing and selling the fine cargoes you have brought me and in counting and dividing the treasure you have locked in your iron-bound chests and you shall attend to all that my reformed cutthroat my regenerated sea robber you shall have a room of your own where you can take off that brave uniform and where you can do your work and keep your accounts and so shall be happier than you ever were before feeling that you are in your right place to all this steed bonnet did not answer a word he did not even raise his head 
and now for you my chaplain said blackbeard suddenly turning toward ben greenway what would you like would it suit you better to go overboard or to conduct prayers for my pious crew i would stay with my master said the scotchman quietly the pirate looked steadily at greenway ho ho said he you are a sturdy fellow and have a mind to speak from being so stiff yourself you may be able to stiffen a little this rag of a master of yours and help him to understand the work he has to do which he will bravely do i ween when he finds that to be my clerk is his career ha ha sir nightcap the pirate of the pen and ink deeply sunk these words into steed bonnet's heart but he made no sign when blackbeard went back to the revenge he took with him all of his own effects which he cared for and he also took the ex-pirate's uniform cocked hat and sword i may have use for them he said and my clerk can wear common clothes like common people when her new commander reached the revenge dickory immediately approached him and earnestly besought him that he might be sent to join captain bonnet and ben greenway they are my friends said dickory and i have none here and i have brought a message to captain bonnet from his daughter and it is urgently necessary that i return with one from him to her i must instantly endeavor to find a ship which is bound for jamaica and sail upon her i have nothing to do with this ship having come on board of her simply to carry my message and it behooves me that i return quickly to those who sent me else injury may come of it i like your speech my boy i like your speech cried blackbeard and he roared out a big laugh urgently necessary you must do this you must do that it is so long since i have heard such words that they will come to me like wine from a cool vault at this dickory flushed hot but he shut his mouth you are a brave fellow cried blackbeard and above the common you are above the common there is that in your eye that could never be seen in the eye of a sugar planter you will make a good pirate pirate cried dickory losing all sense of prudence i would sooner be a wild beast in the forest than to be a pirate blackbeard laughed loudly a good fellow a brave fellow he cried no man who has not the soul of a pirate within him could stand on his legs and speak those words to me sail to jamaica to carry messages to girls never you shall stay with me you shall be a pirate you shall be the head of all the pirates when i give up the business and take to sugar planting ha ha when i take to sugar planting and merrily make my own good rum dickory was dismayed but captain blackbeard he said with more deference than before i cannot cannot shouted the pirate you lie you can say not cannot to me you can do anything i tell you and do it you shall and now i am going to put you in your place and see that you hold it and fill it and if you please me not you carry no more messages in this world nor receive them charter i now make you the first officer of the revenge under me you cannot be mate because you know nothing of sailing a ship and besides no mate nor any quartermaster is worthy to array himself as i shall array you i make you first lieutenant and you shall wear the uniform and the cocked hat which sir nightcap hath no further use for with that he went forward to speak to some of the men leaving dickory standing speechless with the expression of an infuriated idiot black paul stepped up to him how now youngster said the ex-sailing master first officer eh if you look sharp you may find yourself in fine feather no i will not answered dickory 
i will have nothing to do with this black pirate i will not serve under him i will not take charge of anything for him i am ashamed to talk with him to be on the same ship with him i serve good people the best and noblest in the world and i will not enter any service under him hold ye hold ye said black paul you will not serve the good people you speak of by going overboard with a bullet in your head think of that youngster it is a poor way of helping your friends by quitting the world and leaving them in the lurch at this moment blackbeard returned and when he saw bittern he roared at him out of that you sea-cat and if i see you again speaking to my lieutenant i'll slash your ears for you in the next boat which leaves this ship i shall send you to one of the others i will have no sneaking schemer on board the revenge get ye forward get ye forward or i shall help ye with my cutlass and the man who had safely brought two good ships richly laden into the harbor of belize and who had given blackbeard the information which made him understand the character of captain bonnet and how easy it would be to take possession of his person and his vessels and who had done everything in his power to enable the black-hearted pirate to secure to himself bonnet's property and crews and who had only asked in return an actual command where before he had commanded in fact though not in name fled away from the false confederate to whom he had just given wealth and increased prestige the last words of the unfortunate bittern sunk quickly and deeply into the heart of dickory if he should really go overboard with a bullet in his brain farewell to kate bonnet farewell to his mother he was yet a very young man and it had been but a little while since he had been wandering barefooted over the ships at bridgetown selling the fruit of his mother's little farm since that he had loved and lived so long that he could not calculate the period and now he was a man and stood trembling at the point where he was to decide to begin life as a pirate or end everything before blackbeard had turned his lowering visage from his retreating benefactor dickory had decided that whatever might happen he would not of his own free will leave life and fair kate bonnet and so you are to be my first lieutenant said blackbeard his face relaxing i am glad of that there was nothing needed on this ship but a decent man i have put one on my old vessel and if there were another to be found in the gulf of honduras i'd clap him on that goodly bark now sir down to your berth and don your naval finery you're always to wear it you're not fit to wear the clothes of a real sailor and i have no landsman's toggery on this ship dickory bowed he could not speak and went below when next he appeared on deck he wore the ex-captain bonnet's uniform and the tall plumed hat it is for kate's sweet sake he said to himself as he mounted the companionway for her sake i'd wear anything i'd do anything if only i may see her again when the new first lieutenant showed himself upon the quarter-deck there was a general howl from the crew and peal after peal of derisive laughter rent the air then blackbeard stepped quietly forward and ordered eight of the jeerers to be strung up and flogged i would like you all to remember said the master pirate that when i appoint an officer on this ship there is to be no sneering at him nor any want of respect and it strikes me that i shall not have to say anything more on the subject to this precious crew at any rate the next day lively times began on board the two rich prizes which the pirate blackbeard had lately taken 
there had been scarcely more hard work and excitement cursing and swearing when the rich freight had been taken from the merchantman which had originally carried it poor bonnet's pen worked hard at lists and calculations for blackbeard was a practical man and not disposed to loose and liberal dealings with either his men or the trade folk ashore at times the troubled and harassed mind of the former captain of the revenge would have given way under the strain had not ben greenway stayed bravely by him who although a slow accountant was sure and a great help to one who in these times of hurry and flurry was extremely rapid and equally uncertain blackbeard was everywhere anxious to complete the unloading and disposal of his goods before the weather changed but wherever he went he remembered that upon the quarter-deck of his fine new ship the revenge there was one who knowing nothing of nautical matters was above all suspicion of nautical interferences and who although having no authority represented the most powerful nautical commander in all those seas End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of kate bonnet this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gloria begaman somerville south carolina kate bonnet by frank r stockton chapter twenty one north one south if our dear kate bonnet had really imagined in her inexperienced mind that it would be a matter of days and perhaps weeks to procure a vessel in which she with her uncle and good dame charter could sail forth to save her father she was wonderfully mistaken not a free-footed vessel of any class came into the harbor of kingston sloops and barks and ships in general arrived and departed but they were all bound by one contract or another and were not free to sail away here and there for a short time or a long time at the word of a maiden's will mr delaplaine was a rich man but he was a prudent one and he had not the money to waste in wild rewards even if there had been an opportunity for him to offer them kate was disconcerted disappointed and greatly cast down the vengeful badger was scouring the seas in search of her father commissioned to destroy him and eager in his hot passion to do it and here was she with a respite for that father if only she were able to carry it day after day kate waited for notice of a craft not only one which might bring dickory back but one which might carry her away the optimism of dame charter would not now bear her up the load which had been put upon it was too big everything about her was melancholy and depressed and dickory had not come back so many things had happened since he went away and so many days had passed and she had entirely exhausted her plentiful stock of good reasons why her son had not been able to return to her the governor was very kind frequently he came to the delaplaine mansion and always he brought assurance that although he had not heard anything from captain vince there was every reason to suppose that before long he would find some way to send him his commands that captain bonnet should not be injured but should be brought back safely to jamaica and then kate would say with tears in her eyes but your excellency we cannot wait for that we must go we must deliver ourselves your message to the captain of the badger who else will do it and we cannot trust to chance while we are trusting and hoping my father may die at such moments mr delaplaine would sometimes say in his heart not daring to breathe such thoughts aloud 
and what could be better than that he should die and be done with it he is a thorn in the side of the young the good and the beautiful and as long as he lives that thorn will rankle moreover not only did the good merchant harbor such a wicked thought but dame charter thought something of the very same kind though differently expressed if he had never been born she would say to herself how much better it would have been but then the thought would come crowding in how bad that would have been for dickory and for the plans she was making for him in the midst of all this uncertainty this anxiety this foreboding almost this despair there came a sunburst which lighted up the souls of these three good people which made their eyes sparkle and their hearts swell with thankfulness this happiness came in the shape of a letter from martin newcomb the letter was a long one and told many things the first part of it kate read to herself and kept to herself for in burning words it assured her that he loved her and would always love her and that no misfortune of her own nor wrongdoings of others could prevent him from offering her his most ardent and unchanged affection moreover he begged and implored her to accept that affection to accept it now that it might belong to her forever happiness he said seemed opening before her he implored her to allow him to share that happiness with her the rest of the letter was read most jubilantly aloud it told of news which had come to newcomb from honduras gulf great news wonderful news which would make the heart sing major bonnet was at belize he had given up all connection with piracy and was now engaged in mercantile pursuits this was positively true for the person who had sent the news to bridgetown had seen major bonnet and had talked to him and had been informed by him that he had given up his ship and was now an accountant and commission agent doing business at that place the sender of this great news also stated that ben greenway was with major bonnet working as his assistant and here dame charter sat open-mouthed and her heart nearly stopped beating young dickory charter had also been in the port and had gone away but was expected ere long to return kate stood on her tiptoes and waved the letter over her head to belize my dear uncle to belize if we cannot get there any other way we must go in a boat with oars we must fly we must not wait perhaps he is seeking in disguise to escape the vengeance of the wicked vince but that matters not we know where he is we must fly uncle we must fly the opportunities for figurative flying were not wanting there were no vessels in the port which might be engaged for an indeterminate voyage in pursuit of a british man-of-war but there was a goodly sloop about to sail in ballast for belize before sunset three passages were engaged upon this sloop kate sat long into the night her letter in her hand here was a lover who loved her a lover who had just sent to her not only love but life a lover who had no intention of leaving her because of her overshadowing sorrow but who had lifted that sorrow and had come to her again ay more she knew that if the sorrow had not been lifted he would have come to her again the governor of jamaica was a man of hearty sympathies and these worked so strongly in him that when kate and her uncle came to bring him the good news he kissed her and vowed that he had not heard anything so cheering for many a year i have been greatly afraid of that vince he said although i did not mention it i have been greatly afraid of him he is a terrible fellow when he is crossed and so hot-headed that it is easy to cross him 
there were so many chances of his catching your father and so few chances of my orders catching him but it is all right now you will be able to reach your father before vince can possibly get to him even should he be able to do him injury in his present position your father my dear must have been as mad as a march hare to embark upon a career of a pirate when all the time his heart was really turned to ways of peace to planting to mercantile pursuits to domestic joys here now was to be a voyage of conquest no matter what his plans were no matter what he said no matter what he might lose or how he might suffer by being taken into captivity and being carried away major steed bonnet late of bridgetown and still later connected with some erratic voyages upon the high seas was to be taken prisoner by his daughter and carried away to spanish town where the actions of his disordered mind were to be condoned and where he would be safe from all vengeful vinces and from all temptations of the flaunting skull and bones it was a bright morning when with the fair wind upon her starboard bow the sloop belinda bearing the jubilant three sailed southward on her course to the coast of honduras and it was upon that same morning that the good ship revenge bearing the pirate blackbeard and his handsomely uniformed lieutenant sailed northward the same fair wind upon her port bow End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of kate bonnet this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gloria begeman somerville south carolina kate bonnet by frank r stockton chapter twenty one a projected marriage strange as it may appear dickory charter was not a very unhappy young fellow as he stood in his fine uniform on the quarter-deck of the revenge the fresh breeze ruffling his brown curls when he lifted his heavy cocked hat true he was leaving behind him his friends captain bonnet and ben greenway with whom the wayward blackbeard would allow no word of leave-taking true he was going he knew not where and in the power of a man noted the new world over for his savage eccentricities and true he might soon be sailing hour by hour farther and farther away from the island on which dwelt the angel kate that angel kate and his mother but none of these considerations could keep down the glad feeling that he was going that he was moving moreover in answer to one of his impassioned appeals to be set ashore at jamaica blackbeard had said to him that if he should get tired of him he did not see at that moment any reason why he should not put him on board some convenient vessel and have him landed at kingston dickory did not believe very much in the black-bearded pirate with his wild tricks and inhuman high spirits but jamaica lay to the east and he was going eastward incited perhaps by the possession of a fine ship manned by a crew picked from his old vessel and from the men who had formed the crew of the revenge blackbeard was in better spirits than was his wont and so far as his nature would allow he treated dickory with fair good humour but no matter what happened his unrestrained imagination never failed him having taken the fancy to see dickory always in full uniform he allowed him to assume no other clothes he was always in naval full dress and cocked hat and his duties 
were those of a private secretary the only shrewd thing i ever knew your sir nightcap to do he said was to tell me you could not read nor write he spoke so glibly that i believed him had it not been so i should have sent you to the town to help with the shore end of my affairs and then you would have been there still and i should have had no admiral to write my log and straighten my accounts sometimes in his quieter moods when there was no provocation to send pistol balls between two sailors quietly conversing or to perform some other demoniac trick blackbeard would talk to dickory and ask all manner of questions some of which the young man answered while some he tried not to answer thus it was that the pirate found out a great deal more about dickory's life hope and sorrows than the young fellow imagined that he made known he discovered that dickory was greatly interested in bonnet's daughter and wished above all other things in this world to get to her and to be with her this was a little out of the common run of things among the brotherhood it was their fashion to forget so far as they were able the family ties which already belonged to them and to make no plans for any future ties of that sort which they might be able to make such a thing amused the generally rampant blackbeard but if this dickory boy whom they had on board really did wish to marry some one the idea came into the crafty mind of blackbeard that he would like to attend to that marrying himself it pleased him to have a finger in every pie and now here was a pie in the fingering of which he might take a novel interest this renowned desperado this bloody cutthroat this merciless pirate possessed a home a quiet little english home on the cornwall coast where the cheerful woods and fields stretched down almost in reach of the sullen sea here dwelt his wife quiet mistress thatch and here his brawny daughter seldom a word came to this rural home from the father burning and robbing sinking and slaying out upon the western seas but from the stores of pelf which so often slipped so easily into his great arms and which so often slipped just as easily out of them came now and then something to help the brawn grow upon his daughter's bones and to ease the labors of his wife eliza thatch bore no resemblance to a owry her hair was red her face was freckled she had enough teeth left to do a good eating with when she had a chance and her step shook the timbers of her little home her father had heard from her a little while ago by a letter she had conveyed to belize his parental feelings notwithstanding he had told bonnet he knew no such sentiments were stirred when he had finished her letter he would have been well pleased to burn a vessel and make a dozen passengers walk the plank as a memorial to his girl but this not being convenient it had come to him that he would marry the wench to the gaily bedecked young fellow he had captured and it filled his reckless heart with a wild delight he drew his cutlass and with a great oath he drove the heavy blade into the top of the table and he swore by this mark that his grand plan should be carried out he would sail over to england this would be a happy chance for his vessel was unladen and ready for any adventure he would drop anchor in the quiet cove he knew of he would go ashore by night he would be at home again to be at home again made him shout with profane laughter the little home he remembered would be so ridiculous to him now he would see again his poor little trembling wife she must be gray by now and he was sure that she would tremble more than ever she did when she heard the great sea-oaths 
which he was accustomed to pour forth now and his daughter she must be a strapping wench by this time he was sure she could stand a slap on the back which would kill her mother yes there should be a wedding a fine wedding and good old rum should water the earth and he would detail a boat's crew of jolly good fellows from the revenge to help make things uproarious this charter boy and eliza should have a house of their own with plenty of money he had more funds in hand than ever in his life before and his respectable son-in-law should go to london and deposit his fortune in a bank it would be royal fun to think of him and eliza highly respectable and with money in the bank a quart of the best rum could scarcely have made blackbeard more hilarious than did this glorious notion he danced among his crew he singed beards he whacked with capstan bars he pushed men down hatchways he was in lordly spirits and his crew expected some great adventure some startling piece of deviltry of course he did not keep his great design from dickory it was too glorious too transcendent he took his young admiral into his cabin and laid before him his dazzling future dickory sat speechless almost breathless as he listened he could feel himself turn cold had any one else been talking to him in this strain he would have shouted with laughter but people did not laugh at blackbeard when the pirate had said all and was gazing triumphantly at poor dickory the young man gasped a word in answer he could not accept this awful fate without so much as a wave of the hand in protest but sir said he if blackbeard's face grew black he bent his head and lowered upon the pale dickory then with a tremendous blow he brought down his fist upon the table if eliza will not have you he roared if that girl will not take you when i offer you to her if she or her mother as much as winks an eyelash in disobedience of my commands i will take them by the hair of their heads and i will throw them into the sea if she will not have you he repeated roaring as if he were shouting through a speaker trumpet in a storm if i thought that youngster i would burn the house with both of them in it and the rum i had brought to make a jolly wedding should be poured on the timbers to make them blaze let no notions like that enter your mind my boy if she disobeys me i will cook her and you shall eat her disobey me and he swore at such a rate that he panted for fresh air and mounted to the deck it was not a time for dickory to make remarks indicating his disapproval of the proposed arrangement as the revenge sailed on over sunny seas or under lowering clouds dickory was no stranger to the binnacle and the compass always told him that they were sailing eastward he had once asked blackbeard where they now were by the chart but that gracious gentleman of the midnight beard had given him oaths for answers and had told him that if the captain knew where the ship was on any particular hour or minute nobody else on that ship need trouble his head about it but at last the course of the revenge was changed a little and she sailed northward then dickory spoke with one of the mildest of the mates upon the subject of their progress and the man made known to him that they were now about half-way through the windward passage dickory started back he knew something of the geography of those seas why then he cried we have passed jamaica of course we have said the man and if it had not been for dickory's uniform he would have sworn at him. End of chapter 21